Welcome to the second podcast episode. I'm sitting here with Jeremy. Second one, huh? Yes, <laughs> second of mine. And oh, also yeah. the second take. So for everybody <laughs> watching, somebody is filming with an umbrella. So even if it starts raining, we will keep going with the podcast <laughs> this time. So yeah, Jeremy, he worked with uh, big names in the info space like um, Dan Locke, for example, yeah. and a bunch of other names. So um, And tomorrow he's going to grant someone an award for how much? We're doing a six million dollar a month trophy <laughs> that uh, we're giving out to one of the inner circle students. And yeah. yeah, things like this big from the ground, you know, it's, it's super tough. <laughs> yeah, so one of the students makes made six million uh, last month and he's going to get a cool award. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. You're doing not bad for yourself, doing mid six figures with your own agency. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, mainly doing rep shares, <laughs> but more on that later. Um, what's really cool about Jeremy and about you is that he learned online marketing when there was not a bunch of gurus out there teaching you how to do online marketing. Dude, there wasn't anything. So my <laughs> first question for you, I and mean, of course we'll talk a little bit more about how to learn marketing, but my first question is like, how did you get started? Like, how did you figure all this stuff out? You ever seen one of those videos of a little baby getting tossed into the water and it has to swim? I, I have seen some, but it was pretty <laughs> traumatic, so. Uh. <laughs> edit, edit in a clip of that for sure. <laughs> yeah, so long, long story short, I, uh, I was selling phones in Costco, a guy named Peter hired me, Peter hired me because he said, you're a young guy, you probably know a lot about technology. Uh, you know, he was right to a degree, but I didn't know anything about marketing stuff. <laughs> and yeah, I had to learn all this stuff, just kind of getting like tossed in and, um, you know, had to, had to like figure it out. There was a lot of like talking to those companies for, like as an example, Infusionsoft, which is now known as Keep, I had to call them like no exaggeration, like every other day, you know, to <laughs> ask them questions and like yeah. figure stuff out. Most of these companies had uh, like their support and like FAQs and like things like that. But a lot of it was just, you know, kind of trial and error, uh, Googling, you know, just trying to find like any kind of resources. A lot of it at the time, believe it or not, was like forums, you know, forums, okay. where, where you're just kind of going back and forth like random people who are having the same issues, you know, as I'm sure most of us have experienced when we Google stuff. But uh, yeah, really just, you know, trial and error and getting tossed in like a little baby and trying to swim. So, <laughs> so was that a little bit traumatic uh, or? I thought it was pretty fun, you know? I mean, keep in mind, like, at that, at that specific age, I was 19, and, like, I don't know, at 19, if you really view anything when it comes to, like, new skill acquisition as, as like, traumatizing, or it's, it's uh, something I think that was fun, doable. I didn't really view it as, like, hard or challenging. There's a lot of, uh, like, belief matrix that hold people back from skill acquisition nowadays. I've never really been one to think that, acquiring new skills is hard you know I've just kind of dove in and, and been willing to fail I, I didn't really have any trauma that would hold me back you know M most people have some kind of issue before they learn something that holds them back I, I didn't have any of that kind of stuff you know I just wanted to make more money <laughs> <laughs> all right but back in the day you had books right you were like did you... <laughs> yeah you know believe it or not I didn't even start reading until I started working for Grant Cardone when I was when I a little later age 19 and that was like the first time I started reading books was reading Grant's books to like help with the marketing efforts there yeah. And after that, I, that's when I like really got into books. That's when I realized a lot of it through networking, you know, like I, I'd be talking to all these really smart people out in the world and they would recommend like all these crazy books, especially a lot of the people that we'd work with. Like I think it was uh, 2017, we closed Ty Lopez as a client and we also taught in a few of his programs. And like, if you've ever talked to Ty or even just like watched any of his content, he just rips like 20 book recommendations every other sentence, you know? Yeah. And I'm the kind of guy where like when somebody recommends a book who, who has some kind of result that I want, I just pull out my phone and just buy it, you know? So after a while, dude, I accumulated a lot, like a lot of books. And yeah. I was trying to work through them and read them, but yeah, books are awesome. Book, uh, incredible resource for knowledge, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so nowadays it's a little bit easier, right? Because for example, you teach your whole course with like, I have never seen that many videos. Um, yeah, and that's, that's kind of like my follow-up question, like, <laughs> how do you think people or like st let's say you're a business owner and you really have issues with marketing and like you have hired a bunch of agencies not really working yep. like if you would have to learn marketing right now like or you're like an obsessed young guy girl and you yep. just want to learn marketing like what would you do right now at this point like would you read a bunch of books i mean of course you would join your program yep. but well i mean there's a few things the the biased answer is is to go into some type of course that's going to make it all faster and easier because today mm -hmm. those things do exist. Like the course industry itself has grown tremendously over the years yeah. and there's a lot of like really good resources, both like really cheap and, and still effective resources built for beginners 
from the actual ad platforms and from those different tools themselves, just like how I learned back in the day. Like you could go and sign up for Go High Level or ClickFunnels or go on Facebook or go on Google and all these platforms, like they have resources for you to learn about like how to use and master their, their softwares yeah. and their ad platforms. So all the beginner stuff, you should dive in and like just train on all the free things that exist, YouTube, things like that. Versus when you want to get the more like intermediate and advanced skill sets, that's specifically where you want to find somebody. They probably have a course for like a couple hundred bucks, maybe a couple thousand bucks, and they're gonna they're gonna be like niche specific lessons that are likely best for you. Like there's probably some marketer or agency owner out there that works at a high level in whatever your niche is. And long story short, they're gonna put you at a high level of knowledge and awareness. I, I always compare it like this. Is there a lot of skyscrapers down here in Miami? The views are radically different on the top floors of these buildings in comparison to like the first floors or like where we're at at sea level here. Yeah. Moral of the story is most people have that sea level view. Whereas when you hire the right person or you get the right mentor, you buy the right course, you should have a perspective shift from a person talking to you at a higher level, giving you that articulated concept of like what they see from up there. And then eventually you can actually see it yourself. So courses speed everything up. They're like cheat codes, you know, they, they make everything fast. But at the end of the day, look, trial and error is also a really good way to figure shit out. You know, If you're willing to lose some money, uh, by all means, just dive in and just start spending some cash and you know, do the good old trial and error approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm always telling my clients like, or like if they wanna work with me, I'm like, hey, listen, you have to be okay with like losing a little bit of money. Yeah, yeah. Mike's no, three months. Like, because if you're not gonna do that, then it's probably gonna be stressful. And it's important to note, like we, you know, in, in, uh, in our education company, like we'll get people that'll say things like, oh, I've already bought like five or six courses and none of them have worked for me. And rather than just telling the person like, oh, well, you know, we've got our course and we've already got, you know, 4,000 plus paid students, all these people have gotten results. We, we know that that's actually a red flag, believe it or not. It's the same thing with business owners. When a business owner says, oh, I've already worked with like, you know, a dozen agencies, like all of them suck. It's like, oh, yeah. that's a good red flag that you probably suck or have some kind of issue going on. I know a lot of businesses, like we had this guy, he was two weeks in to working with this marketer and he was hitting us up like, you know, hey, I think I want to fire this guy. Like he's not doing good. And I start digging in. I'm like, what's like, what's going on? Like, what's making it not work? They barely spent any money. They spent like six hundred something dollars, yeah. and they spent like two grand a month on the guy. So they'd spent twenty six hundred dollars in total, and they're already considering quitting. And like that guy as well, he was the kind of person that says like, oh, I've already worked like four marketers before this. Yeah, things aren't yeah, working yeah. out. So yeah, I mean, look, it could be your fault <laughs> as the business owner, yeah. you know. But to be fair, there's also a lot of shitty marketers. So. Yeah, that's a complicated <laughs> one. It's also like if, if you work with like 10 agencies, you probably suck at hiring or you don't really understand business and marketing. That's and that's fair. why you can't really help the agencies. But then also you can get unlucky and work with 10, 10 yeah. uh, shitty agencies. So that can definitely happen. But let's, let's talk about like how to hire a proper marketing agency later yeah. when we talk more about business. Because what I kind of want to ask you, and this is a personal question, that's also why I'm here. I'm yeah. like... What are you doing right now? How, how are you learning? Do you still have mentors? I'm, I'm gonna just ask you a bunch of questions yeah. so you can freestyle on it. Like, how do you find the right people to learn from? Like, how do you decide, hey, I wanna learn this specifically, right? You are doing the AI thing. Yeah. Like, you are like always doing new stuff. I'm like, I don't even know how you have time for this. So, yeah. what, what does your learning process look right now? There's a, there's a really good quote. Uh, you don't know what you don't know. So, look, kind of look at it like a funnel, right? Like, you got like the top of funnel stuff. Yeah. That's where like books, uh, random videos, you know, like if I'm sitting down at lunch or dinner, I'll always watch a little like five, 10 minute YouTube video. And long story short, like a lot of that type of learning like opens you up to new things. You know, like I've read books on like genetic editing that have then led me to specific companies that might be able to take like migraines or like MS or like any kind of genetic related things I can hand down to my children one day out of the equation. But I wouldn't be aware of those companies or of those solutions had I not initially been introduced to the idea of like what genetic editing is. And that was through a book. And yeah. long, I don't even remember how I heard of that book. It was probably an like somebody just saying like, oh, hey, read this. So you, you have to just like stumble around into a bunch of areas that you don't really have awareness in to kind of unlock like different things that you can turn around and, and do and learn about. And that's usually when you dive into these like rabbit holes, you know, which I'm sure you've done before. And that's where you unlock a bunch of cool stuff. Like if you, you know, get into the AI thing, there are so many different like versions of rabbit holes you can go down. Like I remember when I first understood the concept of just a large language model, I immediately started looking up solutions to train a large language model specifically on like a company's data set. 
so I could attempt to replicate myself so people could ask questions as if it was me through a chat bot, yeah. you know? And there's all kinds, like there's uh, large action models is what they're calling them now, LAMs. There's a little device, I don't know if you heard of it, called the R1. By com it's called Rabbit R1 is specifically the name of the device, like 200 bucks when you pre-order it. And rather than being like a large, la large language model in LLA, or I'm sorry, LLM, they're, they're going LAM, large action model. So this little device has like a camera and voice recognition and like a small screen, it's like a little red square, kind of like the size of a phone, but square instead of a rectangle. Yeah. And you walk around with this thing and you essentially can like give it commands for like things that you want it to do. And you can connect it to like all these other softwares, devices, like smart home things. And it functions, I think, I think to be honest, it's gonna be pretty redundant pretty quickly, but still it's pretty cool. And I became aware of that long story short, also just by like diving down a rabbit hole of, was there anything that AI can actually like do right now rather than just like, you know, talk to it kind of like a chat bot or like yeah. chat GPT or something like that. So anyway, moral of the story, a lot of it is you become aware of something that you previously were unaware of, and then you just be willing to like dive into specific rabbit holes, find a bunch of cool stuff, you know, be willing to spend like 200 bucks on that, on that R1 device to like see what the hell that does, you know, and then what, could, what that could lead to next. And then outside of that, like marketing and business wise, a lot of it nowadays is experience based. I mean, we, we spend a lot of money every month. <laughs> we, get, we get a lot of perspective from that. We get a lot of data from that. And there's also, typically when you spend a lot of money, there's um, a lot of other people out there who also spend a lot of money that you will have like very natural conversations with, you kind of share some perspectives on like what's working, what's not working. You know, like you have groups like our Inner Circle program where there's other high level advertisers and you know, you just kind of go and you see it all the time. You just go in there, you ask a question, see if anybody else is experiencing the same things. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, have, I, I do have some mentors. They're all like result-based mentors. Like they, they have something that I want to accomplish. They did something that I want to do. And a lot of those guys are like very like high level nowadays. Uh, or they're very like result specific. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me as an example, like when I went from being a vegan to like non-vegan, uh, that was a whole episode in itself where I had to hire a high performance coach to like do blood work for the first time. And I spent tens of thousands of dollars on like recovery related equipment. My recovery was so poor, we thought my whoop band was broken. We had the aura <laughs> ring and the whoop band at the same time. I had the HRV, which is heart rate variability of a, of a, a 90 to 100 year old male. And uh, it, was a, it was a essentially a statistic of my nervous system state. I was like perpetually engaged. After I finally got all that figured out, <laughs> you know, then I started getting migraines, I started getting migraines and aura symptoms. Now I have like neurologists and I have all these people that are trying to like give me different medications, different wellness routines. And that's, that's in itself been like a hell of a process, you know, and then through that, they put me on specific medications where I gained a lot of weight. And then through gaining weight, it's like now I have specific coaches and mentors that help me lose weight, you know? Yeah. So some of it's like seasonal, like seasonal mentors and like seasonal coaches. Yeah. And then some of it is like long term, like, you know, I've, I've mentors who've sold companies for a couple hundred million dollars that, you know, actively I, I talk to infrequently. And it's more about like action and, and just very simple piece of advice they give, but they take a hell of a long time to like implement and execute, you know? So yeah, anyway, long story short, all kinds of people that train me and, and teach me what to do. My own experience is train and teach me what to do. And then just trying to become aware of a bunch of new stuff that I don't think I'm interested in, you know, that ends up being like quite interesting and, and things I, I, I end up finding like a lot of, a lot of passion about, you know? So you force yourself, you just said like looking into things that I'm not interested in, like you yeah. force yourself to like get interested or you just like, yeah. you're like, okay, now I'm going to read a book. How does that happen? I'm curious. My, my old high performance coach, he was uh, trying to get me into like all the spirituality stuff. And I remember I told him one time, like, dude, I don't care about this at all. Like this doesn't make me any money. You know, like I just want to get richer. And I want, I want to have like, I want to be more focused on health and like longevity, you know, and I don't understand why you're talking to me about this stuff. Like, I'm, I don't really care to talk about this. Yeah. And he gave me an analogy with the dots, you know, and he was like, Jeremy, like act like everything you know is like just a bunch of dots, like in the middle of, of like what you're picturing right now. He's like, occasionally my job is to like talk about some dots that are way over here that in no way, shape or form are connected to like these current dots. And initially, especially upon like introduction, those things aren't going to make any sense. Like you're not going to be able to connect them to what you currently know or make a mm. bridge easily. And, you know, through time, as like a few more of those dots over there render into existence, you will eventually find some connections and some value from those things. And, you know, same thing. I trust my coaches when I, when I hire people. So I kind of listened to what he said and I, I let him continue, like lead me down this road. And it did end up being like quite helpful, believe it or not, in, uh, in a lot of different ways that I didn't initially think it would be. You know, I kind of initially, once again, I thought it was a big waste of time. 
And long story short, it ended up being something I found quite valuable. So I try to actively, since that specific lesson, I try to always find those like random dots that aren't connected to like anything I know or anything I think I value. And overall, if you just picture like those dots again, it kind of just expands like your overall awareness. There's things, you know, at age 29 right now that, you know, I'm not gonna really find value in or I'm not gonna be able to do anything with necessarily. So I try to actively focus on the things that I think, you know, through my own discretion, are going to be the most valuable to me now. Yeah. But yeah, occasionally there's something I come across where I'm like, wow, uh, don't, don't really know how I need that, but eventually, maybe like a year or so later, you know, I'm like, you know, dots connect. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, you just gotta kind of be open and learn a bunch of random stuff. Try, try specifically to bias towards things that are gonna help you now, to be clear. Yeah, of course. Don't be one of the, you ever meet one of those guys that like knows a shit ton of stuff, but like they're poor and they're interesting people to be clear and like they're, they're knowledgeable, like yeah. very articulate, you know, like well-rounded, but their, their like current life is just nothing that you would want to replicate yourself. I try not to be that. And I think that comes from pursuing a bunch of things that don't mean anything like right now today and, you know, acting like they don't have any ramifications for being so consumed in them, you know? So, so once again, majority of what I try to learn like sales, marketing, business, psychology, like health and wellness, you know, uh, a lot of family stuff. I think I'll have kids sometime in the next like four or five years, those kind of things versus, you know, maybe like 10, 20% of what I try to learn is just out there, random shit. You know, I don't really think I need to know, but you know, I, I leave open. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting answer. And so you get it a lot from the people around you, clients, you look for specific mentors and you're also just reading stuff that might not serve you in the first year. And I got then some you, crazy uh, books, you know. Some crazy <laughs> books. All right, let's let's try to keep it safe on this podcast. But uh, then that's also a nice transition into the next uh, question. Like, do you specifically vet people? Like, do you have a process of how you vet a coach or like people before you make a decision? Yeah, I mean, it's mainly just results. You know, if they've got some kind of result that I want, or they've gotten somebody else a result as a coach, then I'm happy to hire them. I, I uh, try to be very like optimistic and. You know, like I'm willing to take risks. I, I try to avoid like skepticism and being a pessimist. Yeah. And as long as there's, you know, some type of evidence of a result or some type of outcome that I want, then I'm happy to hire the person and take the risk. Nice. All right. <laughs> that's, uh, I mean, that's also something I learned from you. You're really about speed and just doing stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to spend the money and, and have the person end up being a dud or just kind of learning that like, hey, maybe this isn't something I want to do then like, you know, try to think my way through it instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That was like super macro, macro, like how you yeah. learned marketing <laughs> business and sales. Let's go a little bit more deep. Yeah, sure. um, I remember this, uh, you said it in a live call. There's like, yeah, you know, a lot of you guys, you are like in the ads managers, like a uh, hundred hours a week and you're split happens. testing like a hundred variations that all look the same. So <laughs> yeah. I, I or, yeah. you already answered a little bit the questions <laughs> like, hey, you have a lot of experience, but how how does that process look like for you? Because what, what I think you're really good at is you're super efficient with like, when you write an ad, it works really well because you have so much experience. Yep. But you're also, I think you're pretty good at see, like seeing trends mm -hmm. and like kind of understanding how society is working. Like, and, and what you said with the automation niche, you just know what's going on with the people in that niche. Yeah. So like, crazy niche. how can someone <laughs> that like, wants to start writing their first ads or just wants to like not test a hundred ads that all look the same, yeah. start focusing on like, hey, those few ad IDs that actually really like perform. Like what, what's the process there? How like, did you learn this yourself? Yeah, there's a really good book in, in the marketing world. It's uh, probably the most expensive book you might ever buy in your life called Breakthrough Advertising yeah. by Eugene Schwartz. And that book in itself is like a cornerstone of how to behave and think as a marketer. You need to process the lessons and especially those first few chapters on market awareness, market sophistication. I think those are two of the most important chapters from the old book. Yeah. And that'll allow you to like rapidly, you know, assess a market, consider what's potentially gonna work and not gonna work and, and give you an opportunity to test. There's a good quote I like to live by. I don't wanna be right, I just wanna make money. And I do so in ethical ways, of course, but moral of the story, I, I don't wanna try to like force my views onto things. And that really also opens me up to not being opinionated and mm -hmm. more so being willing to like test and, and open myself up. Like there's all kinds of stuff I've tried through the years that as an opinion, I didn't think it would work at all, you know? <laughs> but from like an analysis of a market and considering what could work, 
it was present. You know, it was an idea that I didn't have a lot of certainty in, but I'd still be willing to try it out and develop some ad hooks around it. And then when it comes to uh, what you initially said there, when it comes to, like the time spent, there's a good concept called Parkinson's Law. It was, um, I heard about it from Elon Musk with his uh, rocket team. When they were developing that Falcon 9 rocket, he specifically said to his rocket team, he was like, you know, I want to develop this rocket. How long is it going to take? These are rocket scientists, mathematicians, and physicists that mathematically quantified to build this rocket into existence is going to take a decade. Okay, so he told him 10 years. And he was like, no way. <laughs> like, it's not taking 10 years. Yeah. Uh, you got six months to figure this shit out. And they all immediately were pissed. They were like, dude, what are you talking? Like, you know, it's math. Yeah. Why, why, math and science, it's not, it's not an argumentative thing. Like, you can't put a timeline to it. And he was, he was like, I don't care. I'd rather cycle through a dozen of you guys, you know, and have it take eight years and have you take 10 doing it by yourself. So anyway, all of them being whiny aside, it ended up taking them eight months to accomplish this build out. And the concept is called Parkinson's Law, okay? Parkinson's Law is essentially putting a time constraint on what we're going to do so we, we think differently about the execution to get the result of that specific task that we're committing to. When you leverage time constraints, which is all Parkinson's law is, and you genuinely believe that something that, you know, as an example, somebody sitting in an ads manager for fucking 10 hours a day or eight hours a day, or even like six hours a day. It's like if you had to only spend one hour tops across all the clients you've got in an ad account per day and you forced yourself to figure out what you would do if that was the case, all of a sudden you unlock all these different ideas and ways to think. So to be clear, I value efficiency, which helps me with uh, you know, not only time management, obviously, but just productivity in general. I get a yeah. lot more done from putting time constraints. You, know, it's, you have to be very self-aware of it, too, because if you, if you aren't, you just kind of spend whatever Randomly, amount of time yeah. you spend doing things. You know? So try to go into things with uh, like a lock you know, on, on the amount of time you want to commit to it. And that in itself will make you infinitely more efficient. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, and to maybe give some examples there, like how do you do that for like, for example, like let's say you enter a new market, I think yeah. a couple of years back or like one or two years back, you started getting into like getting funding for companies. Like yeah, really how do you approach that? Like it's like, hey, it's a new market. You, you know that it exists. You know yeah. how it works. Like how do you do that? Well, common research. So first of all, you put time constraints on everything I'm about to say. We'll go out there and nowadays it's very transparent with advertising. You got the Facebook ad library. Yeah. TikTok's got their ad library. Google's even got an ad library now. And you try to initially become aware of some of those companies. Like if you use what you just described, we were working in the private equity space and like helping companies raise capital. And initially we just wanted to become aware, like, well, what companies are raising capital first of all? And then we're gonna go look up those people's advertising efforts and we're gonna see like what hooks they're using. We're just gonna get some ideas and we're gonna try to see. And all these ad libraries, typically they, they allow you to see the time frame for like how long those things yeah. have been running. The longer an ad's been running, typically the more successful it's been. So those different tools give us a lot of perspective initially. And outside of that, it's like we, st we want to start getting some consumer perspective. Reddit, believe it or not, I think is one of the best places Reddit. to get like mm -hmm. raw, unfiltered perspective. Same thing with TikTok. I think TikTok's search engine is really slept on for like market research. You don't want to look up the companies per se. You want to look up like, okay, if somebody's going to invest into something, like what are they talking about? You know, like what do they want? What are they getting screwed over by? You know, like what, what uh, are people leaning towards? One thing specifically I found during that type of research, which was very interesting to me, was most of these like very legit investors that had the cash, they were very interested in alternative investments hmm. rather than like traditional stuff. And this was when, this was when money was being printed with like 0% interest rates, you know? So like money was just flowing. People were buying things like watches as investments, you know? People were investing into all these like alternative markets because the traditional markets, they just weren't competing with what everybody was considering to be inflation at the time. Like nobody really believed that inflation was like, you know, 8%, 3%, whatever the Fed was consistently talking about. That was the consensus I saw. So when you could invest into something that might go up like 20% in a year, as ridiculous as that would typically sound to a serious, like I have a couple million dollars and I want to put it somewhere investor. Yeah. All these kind of guys and girls, they were, they were, you know, happy to put money into these risks like wine, I remember was one of them wine, that was, mm -hmm. that was being invested into at a pretty high rate. Uh, there was a lot of like investment bots that were claiming they were doing like two to 10% a month. You know, you had the automation niche, which was, which was like one of the wildest niches I've ever seen. Still is wild. Oh, I mean, it's, un it's unreal how, how that niche like blew up and then just blew up in a different way. <laughs> the, uh, the moral of the story is, is like people were looking to put their money in places 
that like weren't traditional markets, okay? And simply put, that alone leads you to a lot of ideas for like headlines, body copy, you know, what your clients need to say inside of their ad videos, uh, what landing pages and VSLs need to be optimized for. But that little bit of market research, you know, goes a long way. And like I said, if you frame all that with that breakthrough advertising book, you, yeah. you, you limit yourself on like the amount of time that you're willing to, to do this kind of research. I mean, it's amazing how, how like much you can get a perspective from these different tools, you know, just kind of reading and listening to what people are talking about. <laughs> yeah, and so just to make sure I understand you correctly, and you, for example, you go to the TikTok library, you check the ads, and you put everything in that like framework of breakthrough advertisement, advertising, yeah. and then from there you start also coming up with your own ideas within those like different stages of awareness. Yeah, so like or? looking at what the companies are doing is is a great way to repeat successful actions. Yeah. But in addition to that, once again, like the consumer perspective of that whole that whole side of the research, which is. Okay, you go on like just TikTok as an app, you know, or you go into Reddit and like you want to use like keyword based research when you're trying to find things. So yeah. as an example, like once I kind of learned, okay, a lot of these big companies seem to be talking about alternative investments. Like I remember this one company, they were managing like 30 or 40 billion dollars in AUM with assets under management. And all their hooks were talking about alternative investments. And like when you go to their main site, their main site is like very traditional looking, you know? <laughs> and it didn't really mention a lot about alternative investments. When you clicked from their ads to those landing pages that they were driving the traffic to, all geared towards alternative investment. And I, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this is a very common trend amongst these companies that are managing, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Uh, I wonder why. And so then you go on Reddit, you go on TikTok, like not, not the ad libraries to be clear, just like the regular apps, and yeah. you search some of these words, like alternative investments. And then on Reddit, as an example, you find like entire communities that are subreddits that are geared towards alternative investments. You just see what regular people are talking about. Yeah. And you start to read some of these opinions of like, hey, I found I can invest. I remember this one guy was talking about investing into cigars. And like he had this whole like arbitrage thing that he was talking about. And he was claiming it made him like 8% a month. The guy had hundreds of comments in response to like what he posted 8%. in this alternative investment thing. Wine, whiskeys, watches. Like there were all these random things. Automation niche, like uh, there was shoe flippers inside of this niche. Like, and then, and then the craziest part once again was you know, under anonymity on Reddit, all these people were being extremely transparent. Like, okay, I've got $4 million, you know, that I'm trying to put into something that's going to beat out inflation this year. What do I need to put my money into? And you'd get just all kinds of people uh, talking about all these random things. Long story short, because, you know, people are actively talking about it and actively interested in it, especially at high quantity, even though there's only hundreds, there's a good rule of thumb in marketing where if one person says it, there's probably a thousand people thinking it. So, when you start to see like hundreds of people talking about it, you're like, all right, well, there's probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of what seem to be serious investors, you know, a couple yeah. million or a couple hundred thousand that are risking it, like reading Reddit comments, you know, like what, I don't, I didn't know what kind of age we were in at that time, but yeah, it didn't matter. Go and type alternative investments. You get all these people that are talking about same kind of things, you know, and then you try to find the companies that are, that are like offering these types of types of solutions pitch them on marketing services. You can even demonstrate the research, you know, as, as a part of your strategy pitch. Try to help them raise capital, you know? And I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a simpler process than what words might make it sound, you know? Is yeah, it's yeah. just you sitting on your phone at the end of the yeah, day, yeah, no, looking on Reddit and TikTok, just scrolling through shit that, that people are talking about investing money in. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it's great yeah. one, like with the TikTok stuff, that's a new specific way yeah, to yeah. do that, which I, I didn't hear before, so maybe the listeners, watchers also didn't yeah. hear that before. <laughs> and okay, let's, let's say we've done that, you launched the campaign, uh -huh. um, you're running ads, what do you do to always stay ahead of the curve, like to keep innovating? Like, is it like I'm checking TikTok weekly or like how, how does your life look like in no, let's I say mean, cycles? Once you, once you make a bet on like what your ad hooks are, yeah. especially nowadays, like I really noticed, I don't know if you see this too, but like you have to really let some time go into it to allow these, these, uh, these platforms to like condition some good results for you and then let the campaign breathe some life. I have a client, I'll give you a perfect example. We launched an ad for this client the first seven full days of the campaign, it was optimized for a cost per call. Mm -hmm. The cost per call was like $700, mm -hmm. you know, for a cost per qualified call, which is tremendously high. To, to us, we'd consider that unacceptable by all means, and we want to shut that off. My old self, I would tell you, you know, ideally you wait like maybe two, four days, and if you see a result like that, you're going to cut it off and like pivot your marketing assets or maybe your targeting or something, you know, to try to get that result up. You analyze for a bottleneck and attack the bottleneck. Today, like in today's day and age, what I've noticed is you really got to give it some time. Listen to this. The eighth day of that campaign, 
We had five qualified calls that came in. That dropped the cost per qualified call down into the 200s. And then it took another three days after that. We're on day 11 now. And our cost per call is in the low 100s. We're looking at like 110 to like 130, give or take the time of day on that day. And I remember that was the first time in, in the most recent times where I, I really became aware that I was like, whoa, uh, I wonder how many times, you know, we've lost like potential results from just shutting something down prematurely. And, you know, lo and behold, every other account that we launch nowadays, instead of giving something like two to four days, we articulate this process as like conditioning the campaign. We need some time to pass to get some initial data, which, take, which takes a little longer nowadays than what we'd want it to. And once that data comes in, it's like the campaign just starts to rip. So we're a little more patient than what we've historically been, simply put, when we, um, when we launch something now. And that can, be, that can be good and bad, you know, because people pay us every 30 days. Yeah. So if we don't get that result within the first 30 days, it's going to be tough to go to that client and articulate to them they need to renew. So we always set those expectations ahead of time. We tell the client, look, you're going to pay us for this first 30 days. We could get a result. We might not. Here's how this all works. Do you understand all that? We make them sign in writing that they understand all that. Nice. And yeah, I mean, moral of the story, we're seeing that instead of like, I used to have deals where we could get, no joke, dude, in the first like 30 to 90 days, we're cranking million dollar months, you know, like things just work immediately. And then nowadays it's like just a little longer time frame. You know, it, it might take 60, 90, 120 days to really see those kind of results in comparison uh, to what might be like the first, you know, week worth of results historically. So. Anyway, moral of the story, you gotta let some gotta let some time pass. And you really gotta understand how the platforms work. I think um, I remember I was it was it was either 2018 or 2019. I had gone to Facebook's headquarters and what's up, Ben? I'd gone I'd gone to Facebook's headquarters and they taught me about machine learning. And listen to this, okay? So I'm I'm in the bathroom, I'm taking a piss at Facebook's headquarters, okay? <laughs> and at their urinals and in their stalls, right in front of you, they have all kinds of like education-based material, but for their employees, you know, so like we're in the headquarters, not where like you know, uh, visitors go. Like we're like in, in the actual headquarters where they work. And dude, so I'm taking a leak and right in front of me was this, it was, it was a graph, it was a, it was a line graph and a bunch of text. And I read about this, this machine learning behind, out of all things, their advertising algorithm. And I go back out to my Facebook rep and I just started lighting them up with questions about this. And it was this, it was the simplest thing I've ever been introduced to that made so much more sense. When you launch a campaign, it's like a blank line graph, okay? And at the beginning of that line graph, like nothing exists, okay? The more data that comes into that specific graph, the more it reinforces the model, which is what the graph is, a machine learning model, which, which was mind blowing to me. Every campaign is its own machine learning model, okay? And the more data that comes into that model, the higher the probability is that the graph continues to go up and to the right. That's all that these people at Facebook who work on these algorithms like look at it as. They just look at it as, did it get enough data to continue going up and to the right? Or did it not get enough initial data and too much time passed? So this is time, this is result, okay? And if it didn't get enough data initially, it just kind of sputters out and stalls or it sputters out and flat lines. If it does get enough data, it just perpetually goes up and to the right, which means through time, a campaign's performance should perpetually get better and better and better. And then eventually, and unfortunately, it just plateaus and then starts getting worse. And that's when you need to reset the model, which yeah. is literally as simple as duplicate the campaign, republish it. A lot of the times we'll also take those opportunities to refresh the advertising assets. But dude, as soon as I learned that, out of all places, taking a piss in Facebook's headquarters, it changed my whole perspective on advertising. So now when we launch a campaign, what we try to do, simply put, we just try to give it a little bit of time to let the model grow and if we notice like it's taking too much time, which for us is typically a little more than two weeks, if we have a client that's willing to spend a couple hundred bucks a day, they, they know essentially they're risking, that's either gonna work or it's not gonna work. I mean, at the end of the day, the model itself, once again, that line graph, uh, we gotta give it the time that it needs in order to be successful. And I've noticed after that iOS 14.5 update back in the day, it seems like the amount of data that it can get quickly when you do off-platform, like website-based optimization objectives, is is just longer like it takes a longer duration of time than it ever did before pre ios 14.5 like dude three days that campaign's getting cut off it's not performing now it's like dude it might be like one one and a half to like two weeks sometimes before we'll consider cutting things off yeah so for context jeremy's doing a lot of like high ticket stuff meaning like people right. that invest 30 to 50 to maybe even 100k sometimes so yeah. you get a little less conversions than if you're just optimizing for like <laughs> yeah, a webinar right. registration that's right yeah so that's also <laughs> maybe why you give a little bit more time but yeah facebook is a little bit slower nowadays that's now right. 
a lot of marketers talk about like you know how to come up with a new hook and like you know do some sexy ass stuff but sometimes it's also not working yeah does did that happen to you like in the last years that it didn't work like the first try yeah i mean we we have a i'm not going to make up a percentage but we have a really high success rate of like a hook or yeah. or what we think is going to work landing well yeah. But yeah, I mean, long story short, if something doesn't work, like whatever. Like I said, I don't want to be right. I just want to make money. So, so what, what, what do you do then? Like, how, how do you just come up with some it? new hooks? You know, <laughs> try to pivot what we're talking about to something else instead. Get the client to refilm some new assets. You know, and I mean, yeah, just pivot. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, we don't care. We just we just go on to the next thing. You know, you the, the keep next going test. with the research. Yeah, and generally, it's like you want to analyze for a bottleneck. You want to try to find where the contraction is actually, you know, limiting the performance. Yeah, and from there you get a much better idea of what you actually need to change. Sometimes it's not the hook, you know? Sometimes your click-through rate is tremendous. You're getting a lot of people to the funnel, but the VSL might suck, or whatever you're driving traffic to might suck. You wanna, you wanna analyze for that statistical bottleneck and attack that specifically. So long story short, if it's the hook, we're getting a high CPM, we're getting a low click-through rate, and we're happy to change the hook if that's the case. Yeah. But a lot of the times it's not the hook, you know? A lot of the times it's, it's what comes after that that kind of sucks. The sales process. I, sometimes, you know, once again, it's very client specific. If it's yeah. a salesperson that that is involved, then yes, that can absolutely affect the performance of what you're doing. But yeah. I mean, sometimes it's it's like your funnel sucks, you know, or whatever you're driving traffic to sucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that also brings us to the next part of the interview podcast, and that is sales. Um, we, you make a lot of memes about salespeople not doing their job. <laughs> I think there's also probably a lot of memes about marketers not doing their job. It's just a war. We don't see them. <laughs> we probably don't see them. Yeah. Uh, and I just have a few quick questions there um, because I think everybody's struggling with that nowadays. Like that's yeah. why there's so many companies like, you know, get a closure that is trained from me, yada, yada, yada. It's not yeah. because nobody wants it. Everybody wants it. That's why these companies are there. So It's true. <laughs> most of those companies are not that good. That's and, also true. Yeah. And it's just hard. So there, that's what I want to ask you. Like, what is your process nowadays for hiring? Because you interview for your clients closer sometimes. Yeah. What's your process for hiring people? Like maybe just one or two small golden nuggets for like, don't do this and really focus on this. Yeah, so it's all, it's all trait specific. I mean, if we can find somebody that has the industry experience or like the industry awareness for whatever that client is that we're potentially hiring some closures for, we'll take it. But a lot of it is, is very like trait specific. We had a guy... He came from a competing client. He had $700,000 a month in deals that he did for that competing client. Mm -hmm. And right off the bat, you're like, dude, that sounds awesome. Like, that's a great closer. Yeah. And, you know, we, he had all the right traits, very competent, you know, smart guy as a, as a closer, you know, and well, well represented himself. But I remember I texted the client that he was working for, and I was like, why did you fire this guy? Like, why did this guy not work for you anymore? And he mentioned, he was like, oh, we got, a re we got a lot of refunds from the, from the ones that that guy sold. But that guy didn't really have his shit together as a company. So we concluded that it was because that company just didn't have their operations together. Yeah. Man, we hired that guy on. Oh, man. This guy closed maybe like 100, 200K a month in deals for this client that we hired him on for. And no joke, like three, four months later, 100% of the people from the first month from that guy ended up refunding or, or requesting refunds yeah. because that guy was setting ridiculous expectations that nobody had instructed him, trained him, told him to set his expectations, but he did anyway. And it lost a lot of revenue, caused a lot of headaches, you know. It was a big pain in the ass. We ended up firing the guy anyway. But moral of the story, if they come with any kind of industry experience, that's fantastic. If not, we don't care. We're happy to have it without that. It's more, it's more about like the traits. Like I just always remember, I was 19 years old selling cell phones. Uh, some guy hired me as his head of marketing because he saw traits in me as an individual that he believed in and felt were like, you know, trainable characteristics. That's, that's what we ideally look for, you know? Yeah. And, and absolutely, since we're hiring on behalf of clients in these closer positions, we're gonna find people that are great salespeople, you know? Like we try to throw them through scenario-based interviews where we try to like, go through a process with them of objections or like give them some awareness about some the product calls, and just see yeah. how good they can sell it right off the bat. Nice. Those, th that's a way to flesh out whether that person has the right characteristics or not. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Another thing I also start seeing more is that like, if you don't have a good offer, meaning like if you're kind of attracting broke people um, or if your price point is not high enough, yeah. that clothes don't really want to work for you. So yeah. they want to make money, you know? Yeah, as, as, a, as a business <laughs> owner, like, from what like <laughs> offer slash price point can you expect to really hire good closers 
from your experience? You know, I've I've seen great closers work on offers that are as low as like thirty five hundred, and I've noticed nowadays like most of the great closers are trying to ascend to like five thousand at a minimum yeah. for whatever those priced offers are. Because that's that's you know when they can make some real money. Like if they're getting paid ten percent of five thousand, it's only five hundred bucks. If they're getting paid ten percent of fifty thousand, that's five grand. So long story short, most of them are going to bias towards the higher end of the spectrum rather than the lower end of the spectrum. That's typically what we see. Yeah. So at least 5K, preferably upwards. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah. I guess like if you sell for 3.5K, if you have like a lot of calls and your show up rate is really good and the closing call is not that long, let's say 45 minutes, then you still stand a chance. That's but right. If yeah. you have like a super complicated process to sell for 3K, they're probably not going to stay. Yeah. I mean, look, at the end of the day, if they're selling a high volume of whatever's 3K, yeah. there's a good chance that they'll stay. But if not, then, I mean, yeah, they're going to bounce because they're just not going to make a lot of money. Most closures that I see nowadays, what they're shooting for in terms of income targets is anywhere from at the lowest, like 25K a month. 25K. Yeah, month. most okay. of them want to make like 50 to 100K a month. And they view that as extremely realistic. You know, like they don't want to put themselves in a position where they have, in terms of like opportunity, anything less. So it's important to consider that like those are the income targets on most of the great closers. 25 to 50K. Yeah, that's right. A month. Yeah. That's, that's that's interesting. I didn't know that. So that's also, if you're listening, that means if your closer is not making 25K a month, there's probably a lot to be improved and you're not working yeah. with the best closer. You'd be that's amazed at how often we like headhunt some, some closers from another organization that meet all our characteristics, meet all of like the things that we want to see from a closer, but just aren't getting paid enough, you know? That's interesting. 25K, that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, not what most people uh, make. So that's a good one. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's really like, <laughs> if you don't have that offer, it's, it's just going to be a little bit harder. And I guess you have to invest more in talent and in training. And that's so true. That's the next thing. <laughs> so you have a pretty interesting process that I didn't hear before yet. No? Uh, I mean, you have your own sales course now as well for closers, but yeah, you let other <laughs> closers watch other courses about closing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit <laughs> about it? How do you do it? Yeah, so long story short, I found that a majority of my clients, the biggest struggle in order for me to get paid more was obviously them closing more deals. Yeah. And they just weren't good sales trainers themselves. So simply put, I mean, from all the perspective that we get from all these different deals that we do at a high level, I took all the lessons and I put them in. It's a, it's a free sales course, to be clear. Like, I don't charge anybody for it. Yeah. Um, I put all my students through it. I put all my clients' closers through it. Like, I'll, I'll put students, their clients' closers through it, you know? I just... I kind of think it's a, it's like a real issue. There's a lot of sales training out there available. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, is like, not, not all of it is specific to like high ticket sales or not all of it is specific to like all these random, you know, alternative investments or like raising capital things that we've been doing as an agency. So yeah, we always just, you know, try to be as uh, resourceful and valuable to our clients as we can. I've, I've definitely become like a part-time sales trainer on deals. You know, I'll get on an occasional like sales training call for our clients nowadays. And like, we'll get on with all their closers, you know, and, and teach them some high level stuff, like talk to them about show rate and connection rate and whatever yeah. I can to help get them a, a better result than what they're getting now. But, yeah. Yeah. And you also Part-time sales trainer, Jeremy, you know, <laughs> and you also let them watch other courses, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> right now, if they're working in the info space, high ticket or like getting, raising uh, money, uh -huh. like what kind of courses or like trainers do you recommend? Yeah. So we always put them through Grant Cardone stuff, Cardone University. Jeremy Miner's got some information that we think is valuable. Uh, I think Jordan Stupar has some great sales training information. There's a few other ones that are like very niche specific that we'll recommend, like give or take what the client does. Yeah. But those are those are typically the big three. Um, there's a few others once again that like once again give or take the client will recommend. But those those are the most common ones that we'll refer over to. And typically, once clients start actually going through those things, they get a tremendous result on the yeah. other side of that. So tra training's critical. We always try to give them the perspective that they're professionals and they need to be trading at a high frequency in order to get results like, you know, true professionals do. We don't want them to treat it like it's a passive, you know, like, oh, watch a video here and there. You know, like they really need to be consumed and like obsessed with being the greatest salesperson they can be just as we are as marketers. We're trying to be the best marketers we can be. I mean, at the end of the day, like sales is a very like time and effort intensive position, you know, it's a, it requires a lot of accountability from coaches and sales management and training is like a cornerstone of that whole process. So at the end of the day, I don't think there's enough sales training, you know, because even all those courses I just recommended, you kind of run out of stuff after a, after a duration of time. So then they yeah. stop or like, do you let them like, no, I mean, average human retention is 10 to 30 percent unless they train or talk about it to others. So we encourage going through all that information anywhere from two to three times at least. 
Some of them look at that as redundant. Some of them never get to that point. But yeah, dude, the best sales teams we work with, they're, they're money monsters. Like they're happy to go through things as many times as it takes for them to really retain it and then apply it. But yeah, as much sales training as you could possibly take. You know, that's like for anybody out there. That's the most important skill that you got. So if your salespeople suck and your sales team sucks, it's probably a good idea to at least let them go through these courses <laughs> yeah, for sure. mentioned like three times. And to you be also fair, I mean, sometimes write. a good idea is to fire them, you know, like when they suck. It's yeah, like okay, sometimes, <laughs> like I don't really want to train people who suck to be good. It's yeah, like yeah. I want to take people who are good and great to like that next level. So we want to make sure the team's like the right team in the first place, you know? <laughs> that, 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 that also makes sense. We will not go into that now because that will be a whole other podcast, but um, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. So go through it three times. And you also let them write notes and stuff, right? And hold them oh, yeah, accountable that they have to put their notes. Well, we try to encourage them. There's a good, it's uh, the Robert, Robert Kiyosaki, you call it the learning cone. If you like Google that image, you'll see this, this, uh, this visual. Yep. And the learning cone articulates that like the bottom part of it where you retain the least is just learning, I, I'm sorry, listening, like watching or, or like reading. The higher end of the learning cone is you take what you learn, you turn around, you teach and talk about it to others. And that could be as simple as like a video recording of you talking about it to yourself. That yeah. could be you sharing it with somebody that you're around. That could be talking about it, of course, to the other salespeople that you're working with, sharing the, and obviously applying it, like literally just yeah, doing yeah, the things. Yeah, yeah. That also increases their retention tremendously. So if you do those things at the higher end of the learning cone, then, you know, very good and you, and you you essentially reduce the amount of times you have to go through and train on it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, we talked about business. Sorry, marketing and sales. I want to ask you two more business questions. Yeah, good. First, I want to get started with like your, what you see at the different like revenue levels. And now I'm kind of talking about like people in the info space or like coaching uh -huh. because you have what we said, like a, a client or like, yeah, mentee that did six million a, mo uh, a month. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious, like, curious, <laughs> like, uh, what's the difference between 100K per month, a million a month, and, like, let's say 3 million plus a month? Like, are there, yeah. like, you talk to these people. Like, for context, you do calls with them, like, yeah. sometimes bi-weekly, I guess. It's actually, um, it's actually a lot simpler than what most people think. So it really comes down to three things, especially at scale. Sales, marketing, and a great offer. Yeah. The marketing's got to be locked in. Salespeople have to be incredible and the offer has to be something that is very well received by whoever you're marketing it to and yeah. ideally you have like a big market mm -hmm. for whatever it is that you're actually trying to get out there and sell to people at scale yeah the um the interesting thing is there's a big difference like when you get to 100k a month first of all it's only 1.2 million a year not a lot of money however a lot of people get locked into like lifestyle stuff there so they'll spend a bunch of money on like the things and the stuff and they kind of plateau at that point because you know a lot of these people first getting money They've never had this kind of stuff before and they end up plateauing just because of comfort and you know, like the lifestyle adaption. They work less and stop learning or what happens Kind of. I mean, yeah, everything just kind of stalls and they don't really focus as much on making more money, you know, because a lot of the times like they've gotten short term, like what they've always wanted to a degree, which for most people is pretty surface level stuff, like, like a place to live that's nice, some cars or a nice car and a little bit of cash that they tuck away but not a lot, you know, just a little bit, like enough of a cushion in their bank account that, that is big to them. The, uh, the people who really start pushing to like 300K, like 500K, like several hundred thousand dollars a month, they've first of all got the right system in place, like they've got those three things. They've got the right sales, they've got the right marketing, and they've got the right offers, that little triangle, and they just start to push it. You know, a lot of people, they can get to a couple million dollars a month, but they don't really try to push it. You know, and, and that little triangle I talked about, like sales, marketing and the right offer, it's like some things go up like differently at different times. It's not like it just all perfectly transcends up like an elevator. Sometimes your marketing is great, but your sales teams kind of suck. Or sometimes your salespeople are great, but you're not getting a lot of leads. Sometimes you have to pivot your offer and like your current offer is just kind of dying, you know. So it's it's when you start to scale, like it's kind of this like. You know, can you identify which one of those three things is the weakest at the time, attack it aggressively it and, down. you know, make it like pull it up. Uh, a lot of people as well, it's, I mean, dude, when you, when you go from like, you know, let's call it 500K a month, you're in six mil a year to getting to the point where you crack a million plus a month, I do, you got to have a sustainable like system to perpetuate that machine. Uh, it can all come crumbling down pretty quickly. And it's the same kind of concept as the 100K a month guy where there's some kind of like mental issue that typically occurs. And I've seen it, I've seen it sprout up in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes it's the client goes and distracts themselves by starting like private equity or M&A and they 
take all their attention off of their main thing and put it into like other random things. Sometimes they over hire a bunch of like B and C players that end up being turds and driving yeah, out the A players, too. you know. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's like the offer dies, you know, and they can't identify that. And, you know, sometimes it's the marketing funnel dies and they don't implement a new strategy. Sometimes the best sales guy that, like we had a client that got to a million a month one closer did like 800k of that you know and then that closer shit the bed the next month business went down to like 300k the month after you know so sometimes it's like a situation like that but point is it's like to perpetuate it you know and maintain and like continue scaling you can't stress it enough it's as simple as those three things sales marketing offer all have to be perfect and they just have to con they have to be consistent more than anything yeah so, yeah you do those i mean you get you you can scale it pretty big <laughs> yeah and i guess like you have to keep doing that because what I see a lot, and I'm not even in the space as long as you, I guess you have seen that more, is that a lot of people, they figure out one of those. Yeah. Or like yeah. maybe even one funnel and their offer is not even good and they just figure out one offer and That's they right. run it for like six months, two years. They <laughs> are the biggest guru, the number one. They call themselves the number one and they yeah. disappear like one or two years later. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, it's like rappers, you know, like <laughs> they get some fame for a little bit and they just die out. Yeah, I mean, long story short, it's, it still comes down to those three things. Like, if, if they can't maintain those three things, and that's the exact type of thing that you're gonna that you're gonna see. I know people who are tremendous marketers that are also great at sales. To your point, and they have like pretty fly by night offers, kind of suck. You know, nothing that you would want to get involved with. And you know, they they I we had this guy. I'm not gonna say his name out of respect. He got to five million dollars a month in under two years. Okay, that business is bankrupt today because they weren't good at operations. I, you know, I, and to be clear, it's like, oh man, it's just a shame to see. But at the end of the day, that that happens. Yeah, you know, yeah. so you got to be great. Got to be great at all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's also pretty cool about you. Is like you have been doing this stuff for like a while yeah, like been a decade now you know you have you have done a couple of funnels let's put it that way you have survived a few evolutions a lot of strategies, you know? and some uh, some ad updates yeah, yeah. so that's also where i want to end it like you have i guess worked right now with the biggest names in the info space yeah we built a lot of them and you're still working with a bunch of them and we got you a closed bunch, yeah. a bunch of them so what's next for you 2024 uh, it's the same for me every year you know i always just try to double what i make year over year uh, at this age, you know, I'm 29 right now. I try to invest more than ever. And, you know, I'm really starting to think like long term. Uh, you know, my brain fully developed after 25. So I've got farther foresight, you know, than I ever have before. So that's awesome. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I mean, main thing, it's like besides getting richer is, is uh, first of all, you know, you always want to maintain just being happy and having fun and, you know, feeling fulfilled. I don't feel even close to burnt out, which I think is also awesome, you know. Yeah. It really shows me over the course of a decade. I genuinely like doing it. But um, yeah, I mean, look, besides that, my, main, my other main goal for 2024 is to try to not have a migraine, you know, <laughs> which is a hell of a goal. I have, I, I'm 19 days in so far and I haven't had one, so wish me luck. <laughs> that's, that's nice. And, and like, do you have any specific action steps like to do to double your revenue this year or? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's a pretty simple game, you know, because we do our rev share models, it's, yeah. we, we know what we're looking for with the right kind of clients. And long story short, it's always a game of just get more of those deals and push their businesses to be netting at least a million a month. So yeah. a simple game that uh, we've played for a long time now, you know, we, we have no reason to not continue playing that game. <laughs> and you keep just going, like testing some new niches here and there on the side. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it for sure. We're not very niche specific nowadays. We just try to find what we call our perfect clients out there. Yeah. We try to find people who, you know, fit the criteria for being a, a business that we think can scale up to that point and, and pay a rev share on whatever amount of money they make. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, slowly getting to the last part of this question. Like, are you considering like, doing bigger rev shares for like a higher percentage or like getting equity in companies or like building a more like intimate relationship where you maybe start a company with them together or you're yeah i've had three instances over the last i think i think it's been four or five years where a client's been bought out and we end up losing the deal because yeah, the private equity company who buys them out ends up letting us go because obviously we're the biggest biggest expense and that's kind of sucked that's made me push into what we call provisional equity so like in the instance they get bought out then we get equity at that time and then you know, or at least paid a lump sum upon them getting exit. So that's but, in your um, contract or agreement right now? Yeah, provisional equity, yep. And moral of the story outside of that, I mean, bigger rev shares are like a friction point in a lot of instances. Yeah. So we try to avoid it. We think our deals are structured very fair. I, I would be clear in saying, sure, we could charge more, but 
you know, at the end of the day, we also got to compete. Yeah. There's a lot of agencies out there, and although we've generated a tremendous set of results over the last decade, and we still do today, you know, we're not just sitting on old results. We do it all the time. We uh, we also want to be competitive. We don't want to add too much friction to like the starting points of these deals. Yeah. So I, I like what we currently charge, and you know, we get paid well off of it. So not too much of a need to change what works. <laughs> All right, so you're not like necessarily looking into like, okay, let's start a side project with, for example, clients that you already have and then get a bigger percentage. Yeah, I mean, kind of I stuff. have side projects right now. Like, I mean, you saw my living room in there full of full of all my candles, as an example. Yeah. I, I just don't end up paying that much attention to what doesn't have a lot of potential to like immediately pay. You know, like the way that we charge now, we have a very high probability to like be attentive to those clients, even when they're brand new. Whereas when things don't necessarily have some type of, not immediate upside, but like, you know, something that comes out of it in the first 30, 60, 90 days, then it's just hard to pay attention. Like I've tried to do, I'd, I've had clients over the years, we had this guy, I won't say his name, he, a well-known guy in the real estate investment space. He wanted to pay us 40% gross off mm. of a 40K offer. And and every deal that closed, he pay us 40%. And that was like incredible, you know, as an offer. I was really interested in it. I was very excited, you know, yeah, and I, I'm like, yeah, sure. And he adds us into the ads manager, does all these onboarding things. Dude, I didn't even log into the ads manager for like three and a half weeks after getting granted access to it, because there was just all this other shit with very high paying clients that we already had, or even new clients that were onboarded in that same window that were just paying our normal fee at the at the, at the rate that we had at the time yeah. that we'd pay attention to. So it's like, I don't know. I'm really honest with myself. The side projects that just don't fall under our existing structures. Thing. They just don't get paid attention to like they should. So yeah. I just, I don't do them. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess like in this way, it also stays fair. Like you have your percentage, you, you know, if they exit, you get your part. So I guess it's fair for both parties. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we only had that happen three times over the last, whatever, it's been four or five years. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's not that that happens frequently. Most of our clients, they prefer to like stay in business and cash flow. And yeah. Yeah, that's what we prefer as well. So works Do, out well. <laughs> does it ever happen that you have to change the structure of the deal to allow for more scale? That it's like, oh, if you yeah. know we're paying you 10%, we can scale this or that. Like, does that ever happen? No, we do 10% net. So, and it's off of actions that are trackable back to us. And, and we financially model everything out for the client. Yeah. We, we vet for all those things ahead of time. You know, we literally show them the math for like what it's going to look like. Uh, there's, no, there's no situation that we've come across yet where that's the case. Where they want to do a big investment or something like that. I mean, we've had clients that will attempt to justify, like, hey, we're going to take some of this gross that we've made and, like, go buy this specific thing, you know, we're yeah. going to acquire it. And we specifically have in our agreement, like, look, you can do that kind of stuff, but to be clear, at the end of the day, revenue that we generate for you, minus, like, these expenses that we agree upon that you already have caked in, that's your set of expenses, you know, this is what you're going to pay us out on after that. So if, you know, we let clients do that. I mean, we have clients that will go spend like $2 million in a month off of, you know, 2.3 million <laughs> generated. Yeah. That doesn't mean they get to deduct that and like pay us off of 300,000 net in that example. Like they're paying us off what the true net was before that $2 million yeah. acquisition. <laughs> that also makes sense. And I guess yeah. you work with pretty high margin businesses all the time. Yeah, so we try to, yeah. <laughs> all right. I think that's it. It's been fun, man. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me on. Second yeah. episode. Go watch Second the third. <laughs>